once more, it is my privilege to be able to welcome you uh, to these special services that, uh, that we have agreed to have this week. We're calling them COVID-19 Spiritual Answers. And, uh, and our focus this week, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this season of, of uncertainty and, and, and a lot of different issues and questions we're dealing with, uh, our desire is to try to help point people to the Lord, to the one who does have an answer, who does know what's going on in our life and in our world. And, uh, and it's our privilege today to have Brother Seth, Turk, Seth Tucker, <laughs> and, uh, and he, he informed me that uh, he refers to, to Sonny Tucker as his grandfather uh, in the Lord, not, not for real. Yeah, you'll get in trouble for that later, brother. But uh, listen, we're blessed. We're having fun. We're enjoying these services in this time. And we are glad that you have taken time this morning to, to tune in and to be a part of this broadcast. And, uh, and as I said, our desire is that God would minister and speak to your heart today. Uh, it's great to have Miss Marilyn playing the piano for us. Miss Joan uh, is going to be coming and, and sharing our special music. And Brother Robert is going to be leading us in a season of worship together. And then uh, it's, it's, it's our privilege to have Brother Seth come and to be able to open God's Word. And we trust that, that God's going to speak to your heart today. And let's just commit this time to the Lord as we pray together. Father God, again, I come and I thank you so much for the grace that you've shown us. Thank you that your word says your mercies are new and fresh every day. And God, we come ready to receive from you your mercy and grace for our lives. Through this season of worship, through the words that are shared, and that, God, you would get glory and honor as we commit it to you afresh and anew today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, join with me as we begin a time of worship together, as we bless the name of the Lord. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that charms our fears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foul less clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lift it up. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. 
name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're here tonight to bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and grateful he sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light. Whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy 
mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend oh worship the king blessed be the name of We give praise and honor and glory to Jesus. Thank you, Father. Miss Joan Pruitt's going to come and lead us in song.
Good evening. Uh, I believe this is going to be taping or showing in an evening, right? Afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Seth Tucker. I work for the Arkansas Baptist State Convention, and uh, I, I am a missionary for Southern Baptist churches in the state of Arkansas. I work with youth pastors, and um, I've been doing it for a while, but I can tell you that it is, it is churches like Trinity Baptist Church right here um, that, that, are, um, that are why I do what I do. I get to serve because there's churches like yours here, or if you're not a member of this church and you're just watching, churches like this are why I get to do what I do, because they send missionaries all across this planet because they're a part of the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. And so uh, it, it's an honor to be here. Pastor, thank you. Um, Joan, thanks for singing that song. Uh, it, it's a perfect lead-in, a song that's talking about um, it's talking about how God sees us in our trials, right? And he's not only with us, but he also, he sees that there's something much bigger that he's going to accomplish through it. He has a goal and a purpose in it. And, and we all believe, or we wouldn't be here doing this, that there is a purpose behind what is going on in our world. It's not just our nation, our world today. The coronavirus, COVID-19, it is bringing people that otherwise have not thought about spiritual matters uh, it's bringing them to a place where they're thinking and asking questions about God, about what life's about, about what, what religion or faith is all about. They're asking questions. And one of the questions that I would like to answer that I believe, uh, that I believe is, is a big question for some people, because there's a lot of you maybe today watching this who you don't go to church. You've never uh, put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've never become a Christian. And, and you've got questions like this one. It would be this, is why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus even come to this planet? Why was he here? And so if you've got your Bible, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And to lead in, there's some videos on YouTube that I found a long time ago. Okay, They're called the Jesus Videos by a church called Vintage 21. And it's out of Raleigh, North Carolina. And these videos, uh, they're, they're kind of satirical. Uh, but And I was a little put off at first until I understood their meaning, okay? Uh, it, it portrays Jesus from the old Jesus film movie, but they dubbed over with new voices and words that are being said. And, and the purpose behind it was that apparently the pastor at Vintage Church, Vintage 21 Church, was preaching a message on the perceived Jesus versus the real Jesus, and so these, vi these videos are not to make fun of Jesus. It's to, to honestly to approach a way of thinking that many people have towards who Jesus is. And, and in that, one of the videos, uh, they were playing hide and seek. with the, or the disciples thought they were playing hide and seek. But really, Jesus is just sitting on some, some rock thinking. And the disciples come up and he's like, Jesus, we were looking for you all over. We thought you were playing hide and seek and we couldn't find you. And he said, now I just wanted to be alone for a little while. You will, I'm a very busy person, you know, and it was the idea that it, I'm sure the pastor, I've never heard his sermons, approached the idea that Jesus always has time for his children. And then another one, the one that, that kind of leads into this is where Jesus' disciples come up to him and, and he's walking amongst his disciples and he's like, Peter, I saw you smoking behind that rock yesterday. And he's calling out all of their sins. Like, Thomas, I want you to say my name, but not after you hit your thumb with a hammer. And he just goes on and on and on with all of these ways that he's calling out his disciples for their sin. And, and at the end of it, uh, he tells them, uh, you all better go home now. There's no hope for you. You're a bunch of sinners, basically. But for us, what we understand is that is not why Jesus came. And yet, for many of you, for, for some people all around this world, and, and for ever since the beginning of time, people have always, ever since Jesus came, why did Jesus come? People think he came for good people and not for people like me, for people like you. People think that he came uh, to just tell us how bad we were, to, 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 to judge us, to, to tell us, to condemn us. But that's not what the Word of God teaches, and that's what we're going to see in Isaiah 61. So if you'd follow with me, uh, we're going to see why Jesus came. The first point today is this, the first thought is Jesus came for broken, messed up sinners. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn. What you need to know about this passage of Scripture is this is actually long before Jesus. This was a prophecy telling of why the Messiah would come. In a parallel passage of Scripture, not parallel in time, but parallel in purpose, in Luke 4, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus gets up in Nazareth, his hometown, and he begins to teach his first lesson, his first sermon. And, and if you know anything about a pastor who comes to a new church, their first sermon means a lot. It's going to say what they're about, what their goals are. And so Jesus, when he gets up in Nazareth in Luke 4, he actually reads Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and then he begins to address it. And so what we see here is this matters a lot about who Jesus is. He makes a statement about why he came to earth. And in verse 1 of Isaiah 61, we see him say that he came to bring good news to the poor. Now, that is both financially and spiritually, okay? Most of what, uh, what, what is going to be talked about here has two purposes, two ideas. Jesus came for people who are poor. He didn't come for the wealthy, influential people, which would have lent him to be a great leader if he would have gone, gone after the rich and powerful. He came for the poor. Why? Because Jesus cares, God cares about people who are mistreated and people who are perceived to have very little value. He cares about them. He cares about them. How do I know that? Because I'm one of them. We're all here one of those people who at one point in time, we have been pretty much broke. God cares about us and our brokenness. But also with that idea is he came to bring good news to the poor spiritually. The poor spiritually are people who are not righteous. They are not good. They are, if their bank account was spiritual life, they would be broke. That's who Jesus came for. He also, in verse 1, says he came to heal the brokenhearted. So yes, that is about people who are emotionally broken. Jesus wants them to know, God wants them to know that they are, they are loved and they are cared for. But he also came for people who are brokenhearted spiritually, who realize that their sin matters and that they can do nothing about it. And they're broken over their sin. A word that you can Google if you need to is contrition. They are contrite over their sin. Brokenhearted, miserable. Jesus came for those people. It says that he also came to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Literally, what it tells us is this. Jesus came because he loves and cares for and he meets the needs of the marginalized. He meets and cares for the needs of those that the world has, has taken advantage of. He cares about them. But spiritually, Jesus came to bring release from the bonds of sin and Satan for all of humanity. People who are captives to their sin and prisoners to the enemy, the devil, Satan. But people then and now think Jesus came for good people. In fact, Jesus' own disciples thought that he came to create this, this kingdom on earth and that he would want to be with influential, righteous people. But Jesus spent most of his time with these people, the, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the prisoners. That's who Jesus spent his time with. He spent his time with broken and messed up sinners. And many people, some of you today, myself at times in my life, we felt that we're too bad for God to care about us. But I will tell you this, Jesus came just for you, just for me. Broken, messed up people. That's who he came for. And so if you know that you're a broken, messed up sinner, I want to speak to you right now. God loves you. Not only that, you're valuable. And God sent his son Jesus to bring you freedom. So the first point is Jesus came for broken, messed up sinners. And the second, it's, it's, this is going to sound almost like the opposite of what we just talked about. The second is the day of judgment. 
The day of judgment is the second thought. Read verse 2 with me. He says, And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance. This, this word, the day of our God's vengeance, is just that. It is the day of judgment. Okay, um, all, all sorts of things have been talked about this. Most people out there in the world have heard about there being a judgment day and, and maybe even made it something that isn't about Christianity. But it came from this idea of Christianity saying that there's a day that God will, will judge the earth. And, and we spend a lot of time talking about how God is loving and he is caring and he cares about people because he does. But what we don't talk a whole lot about in today's world is the fact that our God is also just, meaning that he is a good judge. Because just like a judge in today's world, if they let, if they let people that were, that were wicked and, and guilty go free, they would be a bad judge. They wouldn't, just be, they wouldn't just be doing a favor for somebody. They'd be a bad judge. But our God, who is perfect and pure, has to be a good judge. And so because of that, we know that God is loving, but we also know he is just. He is a good judge, and so he cannot allow wickedness and sin to go unpunished. He just can't. He can't allow it to go unpunished. In fact, in Revelation 22, verse 12, Jesus says this. He says, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. If I were to be repaid for my work, I'll tell you this right now. I might be a pastor and I might proclaim the name of Jesus, but if the scales were there to show I am a miserable, I'm broken, and I'm a sinner, and I deserve reward that is not good. I deserve punishment. And that's what Jesus says. He's coming to judge one day. He came a first time. He's talking about a second coming that will happen later in the future. It may be near. It may not be. But there will be a time when Jesus returns again, and he will judge, and he will repay, repay people for their sins. Now, what that looks like, if we're going to take some steps in, in the process, is this. It's, it's the, the, the place called hell, where eternity is the punishment, an eternal hell. A time of, of punishment for all eternity to pay for our sins is what's required. Now, a lot of people would say, I'm not that bad. You know, I, you know I, we all know we're bad, but then we compare ourselves to our neighbor. And we're like, hey, that guy's bad. That lady's bad. I'm not that bad. Let me tell you something. If I were to walk up to Pastor Mike here, and I were to punch him in the face right now, would there be repercussions? Possibly, yes. He, I mean, he might press charges. He might not. I definitely wouldn't be allowed to come preach here again, I'd wager. Okay. But now let's take that another step and let's say I walk up to a police officer here in town and I punch them in the face. Are there going to be repercussions for that? Absolutely, right? And I want to give credit to where credit's due. I've heard this illustration given before. I can't remember if it was David Platt or if it was uh, a guy named Kyle Eidelman. I can't remember. But if I walked up to a police officer and I punched him in the face or her in the face today, there'd be repercussions. I'd be going to jail. I'd be arrested. But let's take it a step further. Let's say I walked up to the President of the United States and I punched him in the face. There'd be pretty good repercussions for that, would there not? There would be. You might never find my body, you know what I mean? But the idea here is for us to learn this. That exercise is for us to learn that the, the level of the sin is not equivalent to the punishment. It's the level of who was sinned against is the level of the punishment. So it doesn't matter if your neighbor has committed sins that you would consider more grievous than you. What matters is that you have all sinned against a holy and perfect God. And therefore we all, you, myself, every one of us is deserving of eternal hell. Because we have sinned against the eternal supreme being. It's not what you did, it's who you did it against. Is that hard to hear? Yes. Am I saying there's no hope? It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if it were up to you and me, there is no hope. The judgment day is coming. We've all sinned against a holy and perfect God. Now, I'm a 90s kid, okay? I grew up in, in the 90s. I was born in 87. I'm, I'm just a young little whippersnapper, okay? But I'll tell you that as a 90s kid, there was some great television, 
right? I grew up, I grew up with a show, and, and some of you may have watched it. Some of you may have had your kids watch it. I don't know, but it was called Captain Planet, right? Anybody remember that? I, I, don't raise your hands. I can't see, okay? But Captain Planet was a show on, but when I was in college, my childhood was ruined for me, okay? Because as a young child, I watched Captain Planet, and I thought it was the coolest show on the earth. It was amazing, right? But when I was in college, I got this itch to, to YouTube Captain Planet and to watch it again. So I started watching it again. And I discovered that there's something about Captain Planet that they never explicitly said. They never spoke it. They left it out of the description of what that show was all about. And it was this. As I watched it again in college, I noticed that the show was okay. But what they were secretly doing was trying to brainwash me to recycle to save the planet. That's what the whole show was about. It wasn't about the, the defeating the enemy and all that. It was, about, it was about recycling. They wanted me to not have one trash can, but two. That's what they wanted. And sometimes, my, my, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is this, sometimes it's what's not said that really matters. Does that make sense? Sometimes what's left out really matters. Like I've read through resumes before for some jobs that I've, that I've been hiring for. And, and I've read through resumes. And it's not always what the person says, but what they don't say that matters. Okay? And so what, what is not said matters. So the first point is Jesus came for messed up, broken sinners. The second is there's a day of judgment where God will judge. And the third is that we have a God who has mercy and grace. Let's read verse 2 again real quick together. It says, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn. The day of our God's vengeance. I want to camp there again. It says, So if the punishment is for all sinners and we've all sinned, then what is Christianity all about, right? Christianity is full. I'll tell you this. Christianity is full of messed up, broken sinners. Full of it. In fact, Paul takes it this far. In 1 Corinthians 6, he lists out a bunch of sins. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, sex, the, he's speaking about the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, the homosexuals, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the revilers. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 6, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he looks at the church, the Christians, the Jews and the Gentiles alike that are in this church, and he says, but such were some of you. What that tells me is this, the church is full of messed up, broken sinners. It is now, I know that. Why? Because I'm a part of it. But I know back then it was too, full of messed up, broken sinners. So what changed? How, how can the church be for these people and yet there's no hope for them in and of themselves? It's because we do deserve God's vengeance and his punishment. We do. But in Luke 4, when Jesus is reading Isaiah 61, he doesn't read all of verse 2. In Luke 4, if you, if you go there and you read it, he reads all of verse 1, he reads part of verse 2, and he omits, he leaves out something important. He leaves out the phrase, the day of our God's vengeance. It's not there. It's not there. Why is that? Is, was he trying to be politically correct and not step on toes? No, absolutely not. Jesus, all through the Bible, you can see he, is, he doesn't care about political correctness one bit. He doesn't care about offending people. So why does he not say it? Timothy Keller, a pastor in New York City, says, says this. He says, Jesus didn't come the first time to bring God's vengeance. He came the first time to take God's vengeance on himself. So if our God is good and loving, he cares about us, but he is just and we have to be punished for sin. God says this, he says, well, I got to do something. I love these people, but I have to punish sin. So God sends his own son, Jesus Christ, and he comes and he comes to this earth and he lives the life we could never live. Why did he have to live perfectly? He had to because if he didn't live perfectly, then God's punishment would have been for him. So he lives perfectly. Why? So that he doesn't deserve punishment from God. And then what? He gets punished by God. Why? Because he takes the punishment that you and I and all of us deserve upon himself. So Jesus didn't come to bring the day of God's vengeance. Instead, Jesus came to take God's vengeance upon himself. To pay the price for sin that you and I deserve. 
But God loves us. That's why he did it. He loves broken, messed up sinners. And how do, how do you receive this, right? How, how did these people in 1 Corinthians 6 get into the church? Firstly, they believed that Jesus died in their place. They believed that he was hung on the cross and that he was punished by God with a punishment that they deserve, that you deserve, that I deserve. And by believing that, they turned away from their sin and began to follow Jesus with their lives. And that's what you can do as well. My belief is that every time we're in the Bible, whether we're reading it at home or we're hearing it preached online or in person, every time that we're in the Bible, we have a response to make. Every one of us, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, so there's a response. If you're not a believer in Jesus and you're like, hey, I'm one of those messed up, broken sinners, let me tell you what, you have a response to make today to this message. You need to believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sins, and you need to follow him with your life. How do you do that? I can tell you. You just pray a prayer, talking to God, and it's not about the words. It's not. You could say whatever words you want. It's about the heart of this. It's for someone like me. When I was six, I believed in Jesus, and I I firmly did. I, I put my faith in Jesus, and I prayed something like this. I said, God, I'm a messed up, broken sinner. I'm a sinner, and I need you to save me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Will you forgive me? And he will. And in that moment, your life is forever changed because you're no longer to be facing God's wrath on the day of vengeance. It's already been paid for you. And so if you need to become a Christian today, that's your response. You can rewind this and and listen to what I said, but really just in your heart, just ask God to forgive you. And tell him that you believe Jesus died to forgive you of your sins. And then follow him. For some, your response may be this. It may be a reminder that you're a messed up, broken sinner. Because there's, there's days where I've been a Christian for so long that I feel like I'm better than I really am. Maybe we need a reminder of who we really are. Broken, messed up sinners. But maybe you're a person who knows you're a messed up, broken sinner. And you just need to be reminded that Jesus came for you. He doesn't come in condemnation. He comes in love because he cares about you. And for some, maybe you find yourself financially broke right now. Maybe you find yourself heartbroken right now. Maybe you, maybe you are enslaved to some things in your life, whether it be addictions or, or, or who knows what. Jesus came for you. He came for people who are marginalized and hurting and broke. God loves you. I pray that you would reach out to this church in some way with your response. I'm going to turn things over after I pray to the pastor, and I'm going to ask, uh, we'll just t- turn it over to the pastor. And I'm going to let Pastor Mike come up here, and I'm going to have him uh, just tell you how you can respond, how you can get a hold of the church. But every one of us have a response. What will yours be? God, we love you. We thank you that your word is powerful and mighty, and that you... Um, We thank you that you love us no matter what we've done or where we've been. You care about us. So in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Seth, for just taking time to to remind us of why Jesus came. And uh, I can just tell you he came because knowing everything there is to know about you, and about me, about Seth, about each and every person, he loved us. He loved us enough to go to that cross to die for our sin. That through faith in him, we could know God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness. I think of what it says in in John chapter 1 and verse 12. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. He wants you in his family. Whoever you are, whatever it is you think that's holding you back, our prayer is in love. He would draw you to himself.
Thank you, Seth, for just being willing to share your heart, to share from God's word. As a church family, we want to encourage you. We want to help you move forward in your relationship with the Lord, wherever you are in your relationship with the Lord. Maybe you're at zero, maybe you're progressed along the journey, but wherever you are in your relationship with the Lord, we want to encourage you to move forward in that relationship. You can contact us here at Trinity Baptist. Our, our website is, I mean, uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. It's trinitybenton.com, trinitybenton.com. Our church phone number is 501 our church email we've had a few email us during these services our church email is trinity benton at ymail.com we would welcome you to contact us and help us to know how we can help you to move forward in your relationship with Christ. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of these services. And as we close out our time together, let me just pray God would continue to take the word you've heard today and speak it to your heart. Father God, once more we thank you that your word will never go forth void. It will always accomplish the purpose wherein you've sent it. Father, we pray you will not allow Satan to steal away the word that's been sown even this day in the hearts and lives of those who heard this presentation. God, we thank you that, that you love us, messed up sinners, far, far from perfect. And God, you want relationship with us. That's why you sent Jesus. God, we pray today you will continue to take the message that's been shared and speak it to hearts and continue in coming days to draw people to yourself. We give you praise. We give you thanks for all of it. And we do that in Jesus' name. Amen.